I want to pay my respects to the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains on whose lands we are meeting. Tonight, war in the Middle East as Israel strikes back against Hamas. And voting on The Voice with just five days until the referendum, both sides are making their final pitches as the battle for hearts and minds intensifies. On the panel tonight, award-winning actor Natasha Wanganeen. <laughs> Liberal member for Sturt, James Stevens. Minister for Indigenous Australians, Linda Burney. The Premier of South Australia, Peter Malinowskis. And artist and Uluru Dialogue leadership member, Sally Scales. And where should we store waste from nuclear subs? Welcome to Q&A. Hello, I'm Patricia Carvellis, and remember you can live stream us around the country on iView and all the socials. Quandra is the hashtag, please get involved. To get us started tonight, here's a question from Jeff Atkinson. With the escalation of hostilities between Hamas and Israel, what should Australia's position be? And is there any possible hope for a peaceful settlement? Linda Burney, I'll start with you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, clearly, uh, Australia unequivoc unequivocally condemns uh, the attack on Israel by Hamas. Uh, the indiscriminate uh, attacks on innocent people uh, is inappropriate and wrong. Uh, obviously, there are casualties uh, of, is of civilians, and there is also the capture of many people. Uh, the Israel has every right to defend itself, and we call for uh, we we call for the indiscriminate killing and removal of all people, be it Israelis or Palestinians. James, same question to you, but there is some breaking news tonight. The Israel Defence Minister has ordered a complete siege of Gaza. That means food and uh, fuel completely stopped from entering Gaza. Is that proportionate? Well, it won't surprise me at all if it goes much beyond that. I think the Israeli government and the IDF will intend to remove the Hamas terrorist organisation completely from the Gaza Strip and... Uh, from any other position they're in to attack innocent Israeli civilians. Frankly, if that happened uh, to Australians, we'd do exactly the same thing. So it's a terrible situation. It's awful to see what's happening. And unfortunately, uh, you can't negotiate with terrorists. You can't tolerate them. And these terrorists need to be permanently removed. And I fully expect that's what uh, the Israelis will do. But doesn't that ultimately, Peter Malinowskis, have an impact on the people who live in Gaza, there are many who will be put in a pretty... Well, this is... Some people are describing it as a potential war crime. Do you think it's appropriate? Well, well Patricia, wherever we see war and conflict, the people who pay the biggest price are innocent civilians. Yes. We saw that firsthand with the unprovoked attack from Hamas. They targeted innocent civilians um, who were going about their ordinary lives. Now, of course, the appropriate response from Israel is to defend their state to which they are entitled. Uh, but of course there will be severe consequences for innocent people in Gaza too who might not accord with being represented by a terrorist organisation which Hamas clearly is. So it's a tragedy, it's a human tragedy that is occurring before our eyes and I think we all hope that at some point there'll be a peaceful resolution and in answer to Jeff's question I think Ultimately, we will only ever see a resolution to this when both sides accept the need for a two-state solution. And part of the trouble at the moment is that Hamas doesn't acknowledge Israel's right to exist. And for as long as that is the case, it's hard to see the prospect of a, a peaceful resolution, but naturally we all hope for it. 
There was a protest, for instance, in Sydney uh, this afternoon. The Prime Minister urged people not to go to the protest, Linda Burney, which... You know, you don't hear Prime Ministers tell people not to go to protests all the time. Uh, Jewish people were urged to stay home. I mean, is this now playing out on our own streets? Uh, it would appear that it is. I, I know that the Sydney Opera House was lit up tonight um, and uh, there is enormous concern about something like 10,000 Australians in Israel uh, that there does not appear at this stage to be anyone caught up with that. Uh, but obviously, uh, Australia is taking this incredibly seriously. Um, and like I say, Patricia, uh, there are casualties on all sides. And, uh, and as Peter has said, it's usually innocent people that bear the worst consequences. Is there a difference at all between the government's position and the coalition's position on this? I've seen some different variations of language being used, but is there bipartisanship on this issue? Well, there should be. I hope there's no difference. Uh, I mean, what Linda said and what Peter said, I completely agree with. And uh, I think, you know, there are Australian citizens that are protesting and celebrating the acts of a terrorist organisation. That's, that's appalling. That's been appropriately condemned by the PM and the senior leaders in this country. I mean, we argue about a lot of things in Australian politics, but there's no need for this to be one of them. I think we're all in a unity ticket when it comes to what needs to happen. Mm. Um, final question. Peter Dutton says if ammunition, uh, if any support needs to be sent to Israel from Australia, it should be. Is that something you'd support, Linda Burney? Um, I've not heard uh, that from Peter Dutton. And obviously Richard Miles and Pat Conroy... Uh, it would be the people dealing with such issues. But the, uh, the point about uh, innocent victims on both sides is really uh, very important and it's difficult to ha see how peace can come about uh, when there are the views being expressed. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, the call is for uh, those that have been kidnapped uh, to be returned and uh, for the killing to stop. Now to begin our referendum discussion, here's Twinkle Gomez. Australia is a democratic country and all Australian citizens have the right to be equally represented in parliament. How are First Nations people currently equitably involved in this process and how will the voice change this? Sally. Uh, thank you for that question. I mean, for me, being a part of the Uluru Statement from the Heart since 2017 um, was pretty incredible. And what I heard during the regional dialogues were community members saying that they were voiceless, that the process of being heard wasn't working in the ways that we currently have. And while we do have a significant amount of um, ministers who are Indigenous, they are, do represent their party and they do represent their constituents. They happen to be Aboriginal or Torres Strait. That is, we're not denying that. But the hope and the aspirations and the love from the Uluru Statement were saying, well, we need to be heard in this... Con we need to be heard in this country about the issues that impact our communities. And for me, I know what it means to be voiceless in my community. I know when governments do not listen to us, when we tell them this is not going to work, you're actually not hearing us, and they go ahead and do it anyway, and we suffer the consequences. The issues that we currently see are because of that. The constant closing the gap margins not being met is because they're not hearing us. We're not involved in that process. And it's all that thing about not without us anymore, include us, hear us and have us at that seat of the table when it's a thought bubble of something that you want to do because I don't get that point of, oh, we're just going to do this now, we're going to continue on it. How? We're in 2023. Don't we want to listen to our communities? Don't we want to hear what's going on? Don't we want to include them because we know the solutions? Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities know the solutions from our communities. And also, let's actually acknowledge the communities are vastly different. 
I'm, for me, what I find so staggering is that people group Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities as one whole group. We're not. You know, what works for APY might not work for Cape York. What works for Noongar mob might not work for, you know, Larrakia mob. So it's actually acknowledging that our communities are different and we need to be included in the things and the issues that are about us. Well, on that question, there's a specific <laughs> part of that question which asks whether you think, you know, Indigenous people are equitably represented in the parliament. Linda, do you? Uh, there is 11... So uh, you, you're doing all right. There, there is 11 uh, First Nations MPs in the parliament. But let me make this very clear, uh, because this question has been raised a number of times. My job in the parliament is the member for Barton. I represent the seat of Barton. I could be voted out at the next election. Mm -hmm. All of us could be voted out at the next election. Uh, what the beauty of the voice is, is it is uh, protected by the Constitution, which means it's a permanent body reflected in the Australian Constitution. It's also about something that all of us in this audience, in this beautiful theatre tonight, uh, can be joyous about. It is about recognising the 65,000 years mm. of the human story in Australia. That's your story and that's my story. It's all of our stories. So, at the moment, you're saying you represent your electorate. You don't feel like your job is to be there to represent... Indigenous no, people. My, my role as the uh, Indigenous Affairs Minister is obviously to bring my experience uh, to that role. There's been two Indigenous Affairs Minister in the whole history of this country. Uh, the, the issue of the voice is it is, as Sally has said, Patricia, to represent local communities chosen by local communities. Yep. It is not, uh, it's, it, it's not people like me. It's people like me that need to hear from the voice the sorts of things that are going to work. It's people like other ministers. It's people like the parliament uh, that needs to hear what peop what, what's actually going to work. And at the end of the day, if I can just quickly say this, we know as Sally has said, everybody, that if you listen, you get better outcomes. And the one thing everyone can agree with is that it is not fair that the life expectancy of the Aboriginal women on this panel is very much shorter than the life expectancy of my non-Aboriginal sisters out there. Um, I want to bring you in, Natasha. <coughs> You're not... You don't support The Voice. Um, the Voice has been described by these two women on the panel as being this opportunity to represent, you know, grassroots communities. Why don't you think it would do that? Well, they haven't heard me in my grassroots community. You guys haven't been out there to speak to us. <clears throat> and you keep sending me emails inviting me to Australia Day celebrations. I'm going to say nationally, can you stop? It's disrespectful to somebody like me who stands for Aboriginal rights every day of my life. So please stop doing that. Also, Linda, you said about celebrating and, you know, respecting 65,000 years of culture. Well, right now, my people are getting dug up out at Rivoli. And I know you know about this, Peter, Hello. right? How can I be proud of you digging up my people out there? There's over 300 plus bodies out there. And in the last couple of months, 31 of my ancestors, and my family's here in the audience too, that's their ancestors as well, have been pulled out the ground. That's disturbing 65,000 years of Just culture. to give our national audience a bit of context, this is a housing development, right? It's Rivoli. You, yeah. Do you want to explain what this destruction I, is? I will bring in Peter. Sure. Uh, but at, yes, it is, it is very disrespectful and I can't respect a government that won't respect over 65,000 okay, years let of me my just culture. Put that to Peter. Sure. There's a, 
there's a rather substantial housing development happening in yep. the outer northern suburbs of Adelaide and very recently um, as they were uh, developing the land um, and starting to do early civil works they discovered um, some, you know, a significant number of Aboriginal rain, remains, probably one of the largest findings of this type. It is the largest in the country. In the country. Yeah. Um, but, but thankfully, um, the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs and the, and the Attorney General in South Australia has issued a, effectively a stop work order on that project um, under the appropriate legislation and that has now been paused and the remains have to be removed in a culturally sensitive way. And that's a, He has that power legislatively. Mm. Um, but at the same time... Uh, quite separately to that effort, we actually have got a piece of legislation that we've committed to that seeks to enhance uh, the penalties and the powers around Aboriginal heritage in Australia, uh, in, in South Australia, um, that is a pretty orthodox approach. So it is a genuine issue. It's a startling discovery um, in no small way, and that's why we're treating it very seriously, as you would expect us to do, using the powers that are available to the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. OK. Can is I that just something... Say, can I just say... You've already ripped out 31 of my ancestors. None, no Aboriginal people that I know or politicians that I know have ever done that to non-Indigenous Australian graves. We've never done that. You don't need to remove them. You need to leave them alone because that's my history and that belongs to my daughter and her daughter. OK? Appreciate that. All right. James, I want to bring you in. Um, you're also a poster voice, but for different reasons. Obviously, at the centre of this debate is the idea of better representation, better outcomes. What's your alternative for better outcomes? If Australia votes no this Saturday, right, and that's what the public polling's telling us, but we'll see after the vote. I believe people should vote first. Uh, but if Australia does vote no, what happens the next day? What is your solution to dealing with some of these issues? Well, the agreement that's come out through this campaign, as others have already commented on, is that uh, the current system isn't working. In fact, it's failing. And my strong view is that you know, enshrining a, a voice in the Constitution is just enshrining that failure and putting uh, another layer of bureaucracy and another committee on top of all the other ones that everyone's agreeing are already failing. So I think, frankly, we're spending a lot of money and we should spend as much as we need to to genuinely address these challenges. And the structures that are in place are not working. We need to break them down and we need to reassess how we're investing in genuinely closing the gap because at the moment it's not working and the proposal that's before us this weekend is just going to lock in place that failure. Per, I would disagree children. with that. But, 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 but what are you proposing to do differently? I just... Yeah. So... Peter Malinowskis is trying to be the host of this show. <laughs> what, are you, what is different? You're going to well, smash I, the bureaucracy, but what does that look like? Yeah, so look, I think we do need to genuinely re-engage re with expenditure at the grassroots level. My colleague, Senator Karen Little, raised a really important example in Alice Springs recently about a family living on a concrete yeah. slab. And a lot of people might have seen that story in the national media, a disgraceful situation and of course until she brought attention to their circumstance they would still be living in in mm. in those third world conditions and there's a lot of money being spent and it's being hopelessly deployed and it's achieving uh, absolutely nothing the gap is widening on some of the metrics so all the people in charge of spending this money right now are not doing a very good job with it and i think we need a complete so clean we're house to address though i mean i just have to jump in here patricia is this is what we're trying to address. We're trying to say you're not spending it correctly. You're not engaging with communities in a proper level. Like, let's talk about housing. So Aboriginal in remote and regional areas is not... The infrastructure is not done well. You know, it's done in what is a Western system of nuclear housing or family structures. Our Aboriginal communities are far... You know, I will also say to the rest of Australia, welcome to the housing crisis. We've been living in it for the past 30 years. Um, we've, we know we have multiple generations living in one household that the infrastructure can't support. So we need to go back to that basics. And at the moment, the system we have is not working. And so what... Aboriginal people have been saying since also William Cooper in 1930s is saying, we need a voice, we need to be heard. So this is not a new thing, but we're also we've had bodies that have been dismantled, taken away at the whim of every government. What we're actually saying is let's put it in the constitution. So this is your rule book, our rule book, 
So it can't be taken away. So we have to work with communities when problems arise. And also, I still am yet to know what is the solution on the other side if it's a no. Can, what? Yeah, can, what? I, say no. Please, can I say something? I'd say the solution, because I don't think people have realised, but Aboriginal black rights has been hijacked with this campaign. There are two teams, like an AFL. Nobody cares what the players' personal opinions are. They just want to win the game by any means possible. That's the yes and the no campaign. But they're forgetting about the grassroots people in the middle that are not being heard. And sis, I, I agree with you, things need to change, but the people that have been on these advisory panels for the last 30 years need to go and they need to get fresh blood in there. Mm. People that actually respect their culture, who are Ghana, Narunga, Narunjiri and Noongar like me first before they ever become anything else. Mm. You guys need to sit at our table and properly because if you did that at the start and you actually listened to us, we wouldn't be here right now. We would have treaty conversations. We would be having all those conversations that we've been screaming on the street for for 40 years plus, even before that. I'm going to but get a response from... Be ready for treaty, but some mobs aren't. I'm but just going to get a response from the Minister and then we'll get to the next question. Yeah. Uh, the simple fact is this, is that a no votes vote means no progress, no change, the status quo. That's for that's government. What, that's what it means. The issues that Natasha and James have raised are incredibly important issues of cultural heritage, and of closing the gap. That is precisely, uh, they are the precise arguments on why we need a voice to parliament. People from grassroots level that can sit and say, as Sally has said, that this is what is going to work and what is not going to work. One very quick example, I know that we don't have a lot of time. There is a, there is a program in Central Australia called the Remote School Attendance Program. Thank you, Mr. Rabbit. $270 million later, uh, this has got not more kids to school. There are less kids going to school because there was no one involved uh, from those communities in the design of the program. That is why we need a voice to get better outcomes. Where Sally comes from, Men's average age is 48 years old. There is no other place in this country that puts up with those sort of statistics. With a voice, we can bring about better outcomes and change to those things. Oh. And this gets us to the topic of our online poll tonight. We're asking you, with only five days until the Voice to Parliament referendum, have you decided which way you're voting? You can cast your votes anonymously on the Q&A Facebook and YouTube accounts or the ABC News X and Instagram accounts as well. We'll bring you the results a little later. Now, we're going to keep this discussion going. Only five days till this referendum. And we've got a question <laughs> from Mary Jo Fisher. Thank you, Patricia. In the voice debate, emotional accusations are being made that a no voter is a bad person, uh, that a yes voter is virtue signalling. Um, do you agree that this is cutting deep divisions amongst or within communities, um, between friends and within families, irrespective of the results of the referendum? Uh, do you think that the nation can bridge this divide? Uh, and if so, how? Pete? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mary Jo, for the question. Former Liberal Senator. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I try and um, offer a balanced views when these matters come up. Um, I firmly believe that there are good people who will vote no, and voting no doesn't automatically make you racist. Um, <laughs> that's not a universally, universally shared view, but that, that's certainly my view. I've got to say this, though. Um, I've been observing this uh, public policy debate now for some time, and there's only one side of it that strikes me to be using the word division. Mm -hmm. um, every yes campaign that I've been at, every yes speech I've heard, the language you hear is about bringing the nation together, a, a moment of unity. From the no campaign, division seems to be talked about frequently. And I completely reject that idea. 
I completely and fundamentally reject the idea that any act of democracy in this country is somehow divisive. Our whole system as a nation is to invest in people the ability to chart the course of their community, um, of their state, of their nation, through exercising that precious right to vote. That is never divisive. I don't believe when we have federal elections, it divides the nation in two. And referendums should be no different. It's an opportunity for us to be able to exercise that profound responsibility, that profound privilege to cast our votes individually that adds up to a collective outcome, which we might not always agree with, but we ultimately accept. So when I hear the No campaign talking about it driving division through the heart of the country, that is only if we let it. And I have a firm view we shouldn't let it be like that. I don't know what the outcome of the referendum will be on the weekend. If it's a no vote, I'll be disappointed, but I'll accept the outcome, as I'm sure the majority of Australians mm, will. Absolutely. So the only people talking about division are those who want to use it as a political weapon mm. to try and derive an outcome, and that I reject. <clears throat> Can I say something? Yep. That, that, you're a part of that political weapon because you've allowed just people like Jacinta Price and Warren Mundine to hijack grassroots rights. Y you let them run around and talk all this negative stuff while we're sitting there screaming on the streets with megaphones going, listen to us. How long have we been doing that? How long has, have you seen Aboriginal people out on the streets telling you guys what we need, what we want? This, an advisory board that doesn't have to action anything, that's not what we want. We want action. We want you to action every single recommendation that we have said. So, Natasha, that's do you... That's the only I, thing that's going to change things. I ask you a question. Do you blame the government or the referendum for I, giving a platform to Jacinta Price, as you say, and... No, every, don't get me wrong. Everybody deserves to have their opinion and have their say. You guys have set that up. But the only people who are getting drowned out by all of this is people like me, people like my uncle who's from community, people like my aunties who are 80 years old still marching on the street because the government won't listen to them. And it's just like the, the SA voice is legislated here now. Yes. Well, then why can't we get a meeting with Kai and Ma about the burial site out there? You tell me that. Well... Uh, uh, can I just make one... Can we just? Can we just? Okay. We're, we're not going. Can I just say this is going to be a respectful debate? I understand you've got passionate views, but we're that just going to have the, the South Australian Premier? respectful yeah, debate. But, but, of course, but, but I'm just giving the floor to you, Linda. I hold the talking stick. Go. Absolutely. Uh, I I uh, I cannot begin to understand how better outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are divisive. I cannot understand how listening to people is divisive. I cannot understand how recognition is divisive. I haven't said that. Wait a minute, let's me. just Linda there finish. Is, and there then is we'll only come back to you. one person that's talking about divisiveness of this referendum, and his name is Peter Dutton. Mm. I'm going to come back to you and then I want to get you in, James, because that's one of the arguments of that campaign. So I'd just like to hear his reply to that because he works for you and you announced him as the full traditional initiated man, which a lot of people in our community are questioning because nobody knows who his family is. Yeah, and that I, is really difficult to deal with on my behalf as a woman of the country here and someone who sits in their sovereignty. My no vote and my no position is nothing to do with Warren Mundine or Jacinta Price or Peter Dutton. I want to make that clear. Yeah, Natasha, I don't think we can interrogate... The they use. I don't think we can interrogate someone's indigeneity on this program right now. I really well, no, don't. That, that's just um, legal action that's going right now. Yeah, and but, just like but the we're not going to be able to do that on that show, so I'm going to park that because I just don't think that. it's our job. I'll but I will ask there. you, James, um, this division line. And we keep hearing it, the voice of division. It says it in capitals on all of the no... Uh, is What do you mean by that? Like, this is a debate, isn't it? Aren't we having a debate about a proposal? Isn't, isn't that what a country does, a good democratic, democratic we, we, country? We're having a debate. Yeah. It has divided the country... I think that's extremely regrettable. I think there was an opportunity at one point for us to make this a really positive... Uh, well, Anthony Albanese's divided us, actually. I mean, he had a head of steam after... after the... Uh, he got... He got... He OK, got I'm just going to make the rules here. We're, we're just not... Let, let's
let's not do booing. It's, no. it's below us. Can We're just going to have a conversation. The question yeah. I asked, though, because you skipped over that question. I'm just going to let mom. James finish what he was saying. Well, at the end of the day, we all know that uh, there was an opportunity for us to have bipartisan support for a referendum on constitutional recognition. The Prime Minister chose a different pathway. He was cocky and arrogant after the Aston by-election. He thought he'd win the referendum and split the coalition at the same time, and it became about politics. And we are facing the you know, strong prospect that the referendum will be defeated on Saturday, and I think it's regrettable that we are going through this process to get that outcome when we could have had a very different process that saw us unite around recognising Indigenous people in our constitution. The division has been chosen by the people that have crafted this campaign, the question that's been put forward, and we're ending up in this sad situation. And after all this effort and half a billion dollars on a, on a referendum campaign, we will be nowhere. And I don't think that's something to be celebrated, Peter. I think that's appalling. And I think it's a real setback for where this country needs to go and mm -hmm. reconciliation. And I'm, I'm really upset about it. Now I'd like to bring in Clayton Cruz. <sighs> James, this is a question for you. As a no supporter, how comfortable are you being associated with a campaign that continues to spread misinformation and disinformation? A campaign which is a modus operandi of working to confuse people when the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are on the line. How do you feel being associated with Senator Jacinda Price who said there are no on ongoing negative impacts of colonisation, as well as Mar Warren Mundine who stated the Uluru Statement from the heart is a declaration of war on modern Australia? James. Well, I think people are, are definitely confused and the confusion comes from the complete lack of detail in what this proposal is. <laughs> and uh, it was a very, very <laughs> poor strategic decision of the Yes campaign to ask the people of this country to sign a great big blank cheque and say, look, after this, the politicians are going to figure out all the detail. We won't give you any information on how this thing's going to work. And I regret being a politician myself to admit this, but I don't think the Australian people are in a mood to trust the politicians on that. I think you're just using talking points. All right. So I want to take you to the point of the question. Um, Senator Jacinta Price, you said there was no ongoing negative impacts of colonisation. Do you agree with that? Well, I respect Senator Price. So and she's you, more entitled than statement? me to make those sorts of comments. I'm not an Indigenous person and I can't speak from that lived experience. And no, I don't it's think not about the lived experience, people. it's about the facts. Because we, we've got history in this country. I, I I'm not she, Indigenous, I think she holds an history. opinion that should be respected and others with different opinions should be respected as well. So but do you think... Lie, one minute, let me just ask the question. Do you think, because that's the questioner, there are negative ongoing impacts from colonisation? Well, I think Jacinta Price has made the point or the view that in her case What's there isn't. What's your view? I'm not, I'm, not a, I'm not an Indigenous person and I don't think it would be appropriate for me as a non-Indigenous person to tell Aboriginal Indigenous lives, people though, how to feel about colonisation. I think that would be completely inappropriate and I think Jacinta Price is perfectly entitled okay. so to have, have her view on So you have an opinion on whether colonisation has been negative in Australia? To Indigenous people? I, I'm not an Indigenous person. So you don't have an opinion so, on that? I think, sorry. I just find it. I, I think, think, I think, most I think would colonization, have a view on that. I, th I think European colonization has been an o overwhelmingly good thing for the great society that we live in. <laughs> I'm a proud Australian. I'm a very proud Australian. I'm proud of our indigenous culture. I'm proud of the English institutions that came to this country with colonization. I'm proud of the multicultural community that we have. I'm very proud of this country. And I think Jacinta Price is a great Australian and she's very entitled to put wow. her views forward. And, and this is exactly, excuse me, this is exactly why I'm sitting here. Because that is disgusting language. Mm -hmm. I cannot believe you. You are disgusting, bro. Any politician, any politician that sits there and says stuff like this is not, they, their heart is not in the right spot. Your spirit is wrong, bro. <laughs> right? And any politicians that sit up here and ask me b to be an Australian, I don't want to be that. Okay. I'm a Naranga, Noongar, Naranjiri and Ghana woman first before anything and I will never be a part of that. That is disgusting. I hope you go home and think about what you said tonight. I seriously do. I want to put 
Sorry, can I just say one more thing? You can, and then I'm going to bring in one our more questioner. Thing. Yep. Can we please get an answer from Peter about Kyam coming and meeting with our community? You keep skipping yeah. over it, sis. And I know you've covered Aboriginal politics for a long time, but you are skipping over my voice now. Yep. I will ask the question. I'll just go back to Clayton, because we've already brought him in now. Clayton, I want to bring you back in, if I can. Um, and I, I am going to say it again. I want to you do a bit of a... You Clayton, my brother. I will. I, will. I want to hear from Clayton, though. Clayton's come all this way to be in the audience and he has a right to speak as well. Um, Clayton, <laughs> obviously we, we heard a response there about that colonisation part of that question. There was more to your question. What's concerning you? Uh, well, I think, uh, I think a no vote is a continual, uh, continual denial of Aboriginal people to have a, a seat at the table. Um, you know, the point's been raised that, you know, we have Indigenous uh, First Nations people in, in, in government, but as Sally has said, they represent their, constitu their constituents and they can be voted out, as Linda has said as well. Um, as Linda has said as well, why wouldn't you listen to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people when you're making policies about their lives? Uh, not doing that doesn't make sense to me. I respect Aboriginal people's right to say no to the vote, but I haven't heard, because Aboriginal people will be talking about treaty, but I haven't heard a good argument from non-Aboriginal Australia about why they would vote no. And I, have, and I didn't hear that tonight, James. I didn't hear that in your answer. Um, this is, a, this is, a, this is a, a telling point for Australia, and it's peeled the scab off the racism in this country, and we need to deal with it. And voting no on Saturday is not going to do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, OK. <laughs> I'm just going to let James respond, because clearly um, uh, Clayton doesn't feel like you've addressed that. I mean, there was another part of your question too, Clayton, which was about the declaration of war of the Uluru <laughs> Statement. Do you see it that way? Uh, I wouldn't use those words, no. I mean, Warren Mundine can speak for himself. He, he's been very prominent in this campaign. He was invited onto the program tonight to be uh, clear. He was unavailable. Yeah, look, I have a different view to you, and we respect each other. We're both Australians. Your votes no. Um, you know, stronger or weaker than mine in this referendum on Saturday. And, uh, you know, Peter talked about respectful disagreement and we can have that. And, uh, you know, this is an important debate about how we run our country and the future of our country and addressing those challenges. And I'm not going to, you know, get into any personal attacks on statements people have made or different views that people have got. We should have a respectful de debate. I happen to have a firm view against this referendum, but I respect those that are voting yes. OK, uh, Peter, I want to bring you in. Firstly, to answer Natasha's question, will your minister meet uh, with them? Um, I think Kaim is a, one of the most decent men I've ever had the pleasure of working with. But in respect to your request for a meeting, I think we'll do one better and I'll, I'll meet with you and um, whoever else that you would like to bring along to I make representations. And I'm, this time. And I'm, I'm more than happy to, to facilitate that, so hopefully that gives an opportunity to, for a more thorough discussion of around whatever Well, this is the only concerns. way I could get that meeting. Okay, the meeting's the happening. Meeting. Please continue. <laughs> All right. so, We've, um, we can't resolve the world's problems, but we've got a meeting. That's right. Um, in respect to the, the referendum, there's an important bit of context that I think is worth just quickly covering off on. And James has made it um, clear tonight that the coalition now supports constitutional recognition, <laughs> which hasn't been a view they've had um, in perpetuity. This is a relatively recent phenomenon as far as I can tell. When the Uluru Dialogues, in the lead up to the Uluru Dialogues, there was the recognition movement. And the drumbeats of the conservative zeitgeist was, well, that's just symbolic. Mm. If we recognise Aboriginal people in the constitution, it will be symbolic and it won't change a thing. It doesn't have any practical meaning. And the Uluru Dialogues came out and said, we don't just want recognition, we want the opportunity to actually have a vehicle that can give us the opportunity to inform the policies that affects the lives of First Nations people. And that would be done through a, a voice, an advisory committee that doesn't have the power to usurp the parliament. In fact, it maintains the, the primacy of the parliament. parliament. So all we've got out of the Uluru Dialogues is recognition, which apparently the coalition now support, plus a non-binding advisory committee, which had at its heart an objective to fend off the conservative attack point that this would just be symbolic and wouldn't be amount to anything more. Um, apart from the fact that it might actually have a practically good outcome on informing Indigenous policy in this country to improve the tragedy that we all agree needs to be addressed. 
Now, for think, the life of me, sorry. for the life of me, I, I don't know why in our hearts we would say no to such an elegant and simple proposition. Um, now, you can argue against anything in politics, but when you do that, you've got to have the courage and the capacity to say what else you would put in its place if that fails. And we go back to the beginning of the night when James was asked repeatedly, well, what is the coalition promising to do differently? And they said, well, more grassroots listening to get better outcomes. That's precisely what The Voice is. Patricia, can I just... I want to address what Warren Mundine said around the Uluru Statement. And as one of the signatories to that, and I was there at Uluru at the convention, um, with all those incredible First Nations leadership who were there, which was after these, the regional dialogues that the Referendum Council held. It was actually about love. It was about love and hope. The senior people that were there who said, what we need to do is not give this statement to the politicians, because politicians turn it into politics, as we've seen today. They wanted to give that invitation to all Australians because they all said in 1967, Australians walked with us. Australians said yes to us. And they wanted that same love and hope again. And that's why the Uluru Statement from the Heart is actually addressed to all Australians. And it, the invitation is there. And on this Saturday, you have to respond. You have to sit there with your conscience and sit there and go, am I responding yes or am I responding no? To that love and hope, that is what you're doing. On that day. One, uh, one minute. Staying, <coughs> just staying with the voice, I want to get to another question. All of these people have come out on this excellent Adelaide night. Um, and we're going to a question now from Tim Lee. Hi. Um, if the referendum does result in the no vote, what is the way forward? I mean, for example, is there a viable path to treaty that doesn't begin with the voice? Or are we stuck with the failed status quo for the foreseeable future? I'll just go to the Minister. Sure. Um, thanks, Peter. Uh, millions of Australians have not voted yet. Uh, and I'm going to respectfully wait for them to vote <laughs> before we uh, start uh, postscripts. Uh, the most important thing to understand, and I really do thank you for your question, is that this is an incredibly simple proposal. It is about, as we've heard, it's about recognition, it's about listening, and it's about getting better outcomes. Uh, there is a massive agenda in Aboriginal affairs, uh, reforming the community development program, for example. Uh, so uh, all of those things will continue to happen closing the gap, uh, but I am completely focused on a successful outcome. OK, on but the you're 40. a realist too, Linda, <laughs> and you've seen the public polling. It doesn't look good for your campaign, and you, it, you must know it, right? You're a realist. Okay. So on Sunday, when everyone's just trying to work what out, what's happened, what will you as the Minister and the Prime Minister offer Australians, but more key, Indigenous Australians? What will they be offered? Will there be a pathway to treaty? Uh, there, there is pathways to treaty happening in every state and territory But at a federal Australia. level, at a national level. Uh, the, the focus I will have... Uh, Patricia, uh, between now and the referendum is a successful vote. Uh, we will uh, look at the outcomes uh, to make further decisions about what will happen. But let's be clear, the disadvantage will still be there on the 15th. There will still be much to do. And the important thing is to make sure that we as a country go forward together. And that will include uh, making sure that what happens after the referendum uh, is what happens, but let's focus on what's in front of us okay. and that's a successful so James, referendum. you want a no vote. Um, so the Prime Minister made it clear on Insiders this week, not sure if anyone was watching, but he said he would not legislate a voice. He would see it as a lack of endorsement for a voice. 
do you still think that you should be legislating for regional and uh, local voices? Uh, that's the position we have. I, I agree Even with Linda. Even if there's a no vote? We, well, absolutely. That's part of our advocacy for a no vote. So you is, would is not see, because so, that's different to the PM's position, you would not see a no vote as an indication that you shouldn't legislate a voice? So I agree with Linda that we'll wait for and respect the outcome on Saturday, and I think that both parties will be under an enormous pressure to take a very comprehensive policy position, in our case, to the next election, but the government of the day can, can do some significant things at the, at the first opportunity. That's up to them. Uh, we've certainly... Uh, talked about uh, a local and regional process very much envisaged out of, out of Karma Langton. But you wouldn't uh, see it as a denouncement of the idea of that concept of a voice? Well, no. Our, our position in advocating against the referendum is that we think that we can create a very good structure to listen to Indigenous communities and this Canberra bureaucracy is not the way to go. And why would, like, if you legislated it, why is that not bureaucratic <laughs> but it is if it's in the Constitution? Well, this is a local and regional structure, so it's listening to the communities that have been talked about earlier. I mean, the PM said this afternoon that the national voice will probably have 24 members. So South Australia's allocation of members of a national voice would be two people. Now, I don't know many Indigenous South Australians that would say, yeah, I think two Indigenous South Australians would adequately no, that, represent all of the communities the amongst Langton South Langton. Australia. That's not in... That's in the Karma Langton report, and maybe the, uh, the well, Prime Minister... that's what the PM keeps telling us to well, look at, the Karma Langton needs, report. He needs to come and speak to the advisory group and come and speak to the working group and the engagement group that Minister Burney was a part of. So... That's not what we were wanting, and also that's a detail that that will be worked out. And PM of course, said it this afternoon: twenty-four well, people will be on this voice. Well, that's the he number he corrected. used in his radio. This radio is my program. point: they're not talking to grassroots mob; they're talking to people they elect themselves. They need to leave us alone and let us three, less than 3% of the population vote on ourselves. If this fails, we, they need to let us vote on what we want as Aboriginal people, without everybody else overriding our vote. Uh, the, 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 the issue is that uh, a referendum, which is what we're heading towards on Saturday, is a binary vote. It's yes or no. That's all there is. There isn't a, another pile that says uh, treaty. There isn't another pile that says progressive no. There is yes and no. There are two piles. So if you're voting no, you're voting with Clive Palmer. You're voting with Paul No, you're Hansen, voting with grassroots mob. With, with Peter Dutton. Oh, I'm a grassroots. And the other, the other point that I'd make is that the Karma Langton report talked about 24, but the Prime Minister, I'm sure, also reflected that after the referendum, and this is so important for people to understand, that after the referendum. It is the role of the parliament to decide the functions uh, and, and the way in which the voice will operate. Mm. That is not what the referendum is about. The referendum is about recognition and it's about how we want to recognise. It is simple, it is straightforward and it is not all of these other issues that have been introduced to confuse and to create disinformation and misinformation. Sovereign I promise have you, here. I promise you uh, sovereignty is preserved and I promise you that this is a simple proposition that we're asking you to come on a journey with us I'll give you for a, quick a better response, future. response, James, but, and I say quick well, because all, we have not I'd, much longer. All, all I'd say is we've been criticised for saying if you don't know, vote no. And the Prime Minister says, go and look at the Karma Langton report. That'll give you all the detail. Now the Minister just says that report's wrong. The 24 is not what it's going to no, be. I it didn't could be say it was God wrong. knows what. That's so not true. at the end of the day, this is the problem that Australians that are struggling true. with. They say, what is this thing? How's it going to work? What's the detail? Now we've just heard a revelation that even the one it's report on they the, tell us to keep looking at principles. can't now be relied on. There's the voice principles and designs. There's the oral or statement from the heart. There's reports from there. There's also the multiple reports from the previous, from the referendum councils. There's been a report every they year. They all say different things. Yeah, but there is also the <laughs> there is also the, you go and ask and the, the design sister. principles that are there on the website on the Uluru Statement website, on the Yes23 website and the Voice rep website. Why don't you acknowledge sovereign law first? 
I'm Why don't you person. acknowledge sovereign law I'm first and what we want? Because I've sat up there with the elders in Alice Springs, all the way up to Darwin, all the way up to Tiwi, all the way up to my mother's country, WA, in the desert. I've sat with all of them and none of them knew about this. Natasha, so explain that to me. Natasha, sovereign rights are not affected. Well, I have different information, is, Linda. Is, I'm sorry. Well... Uh, I, have look, I, I appreciate and I respect And I don't trust saying. politicians. Look what they've done to us for over 250 years. I can't trust a pattern of behaviour that only leads us to destruction, like Dr Gondara said. It's only going to lead us to more destruction. Sally? I mean, so for there is that mistrust in politicians. There's Absolutely. also mistrust in what we've seen in the media throughout this campaign. There's a lot of Trumpism elements that have come through. But for me and what the elders said on the ground uh, during the Uluru and those dialogues, they said, we need to be a part of this and we need to use their law, this the constitution, this rule book, and be a part of that and be in that. So you, So it's not dismantled. The amount of times our voices and our opinions and the way that we get used to a program, how it's run, then the changing of government, they get away with it because they have a spang-dangled way, new thing that they want to do because it's their legacy piece, not with the legacies of our communities. It's, so they get away with it. And so what we're actually saying, no, let us use this, let us use our skills in this process. And Natasha, you keep talking about you're a grassroots person, so am I. I'm yeah. from a remote community and I'm, well, I'm I, sitting there with my elders and I know my, the women that I sit and talk to all the time want better outcomes for our kids and our young women across the country. And so this is something that is affecting all of us and absolutely. we want that's to be... That's why we okay. should be the only ones voting, right? But that's but not the way that the constitution works. Of course but it isn't. It's a, no, of course it's, it isn't. It's not. Peter Melanowskis? Uh, a bit of cynicism... Uh, towards politics and politicians is actually healthy. Mm -hmm. That's what sort of makes the system work a little bit. It holds well, I'm deeply suspicious of the three of you. <laughs> sure, well, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Touche. Um, but the, the one thing that sort of drives cynicism um, and frustration in Australian politics in recent years is when politicians are seen to abandon conviction, mm. uh, promises that they've made to the electorate. Now, the PM... The now Prime Minister, the then Leader of the Opposition, was crystal clear about this to the people of Australia ahead of the federal election. Federal Labor said if they get elected, if Anthony Albanese becomes the Prime Minister of the nation, they are going to deliver on the Uluru State from the heart, including first and foremost, a referendum on the question of the voice. You're right. So if there is a no vote delivered, and you said earlier you respect people voting no, you take yep. a different view that you think it's... What do you think the federal government needs to do? You have a South Australian voice. We do. Does it, does it have less ability to, you know, affect no, power there's, there's, if there's, there's, there's no there's, federal voice? What happens? Now, well, in our case, we... Um, in fact, it was the very first election commitment that I made as then Leader of the Opposition. It was back in 2019. I said that if we were elected in 2022, we would have a state-based voice and we would legislate a voice to the parliament as provided for under our constitution. That is now in place. The elections will open up in January next year. The elections are in March and we anticipate the state voice will be making its advisory contribution to the parliament throughout the course of next year uh, at a state level. That will go ahead. I think it's unfortunate if the federal voice fails. Um, I think having a voice to the state parliament and the federal parliament would have had a degree of continuity to it. That would have been a good thing. But if that doesn't happen, that doesn't preclude the state parliament from making better decisions by listening to a non-binding advisory committee on matters they know more about than most other members of the parliament. So uh, we will proceed with that federally. Um, well, let's wait and see what the outcome is, Patricia. Well, what's your message, Linda Burney? Last question to you before we get to the uh, next question. My message. To, no, no, it's, it's a specific question. To Indigenous Australians who might be feeling pretty rotten, whether they voted yes or no on Sunday, uh, my, my what me is your message about what the government will do? My, my message is uh, to walk at all, be proud of where you've come from, be proud of who you are, um, and uh, the way forward is that young Indigenous people cannot have the same experiences as their fathers and grandfathers, mothers and grandmothers. Things have to improve in this country and the way forward is to go forward together 
and that's what we're asking for. Um, and that's what we want. Now, if this, if this discussion has raised any issues for you, the numbers for Lifeline, uh, 13 Yarn and Kids Helpline are on your screen now. Uh, we've got another topic which I do want to get to before we say goodnight. Uh, Jemima Kennedy Rochester has a question. Um, thank you, Patricia. Um, what environmental risks do these new nuclear submarines constitute? <laughs> and um, how will their waste be stored or disposed of responsibly? I'm going to make that your issue, <laughs> Premier. <laughs> um, look, the nuclear industry around the world, both civil but also for defence purposes, uh, is now largely very safe, um, particularly when it comes to defence purposes. Uh, Australia will be complying, and, and that includes... 15 kilometres from where we are now, we'll be complying with the strictest, uh, most rigorous of requirements that are placed on a nuclear industry. The nuclear reactor won't be uh, produced in Adelaide, that'll be produced overseas and then transported and put into the, into the submarine. In terms of the waste question, um, this is a challenge that we're gonna have to deal with as a country. I've been very plain about my view about this. There is going to be a requirement under the AUKUS agreement for us and this is many decades into the future, we will have to uh, store that nuclear waste that comes out of those submarines uh, in Australia. And my view is where that happens should be informed principally by the science, but it also should be done on the basis with a bit of engagement with First Nations owners of the land, which we didn't see happen in the way that I think most people, or now federal court has ruled, didn't occur in respect of the Kimber site. But those two things should inform where it goes. It shouldn't be based on state-based partisan politics. This is a national endeavour for the purposes of the our problem national problem is defense. no one wants it. Well, well, I've heard, I've heard well, various... Isn't I've that heard... the issue? No, no look, the, the Wetherill government uh, here in South Australia wanted it. They held a Royal Commission and uh, hired former Governor Kevin Scarce and wanted to take half the world's high-level nuclear waste and store it here in South Australia. So... They've made sure that South Australia will be the location. They held a Royal Commission. They, they bragged about uh, wanting to have half the world's nuclear waste. So I think the, uh, the, the work's been done. Uh, Jay Weatherall, the former Labor Premier, uh, wanted this and it's coming our way. And how do you feel about it? Oh, I'm very comfortable with us having a proper safe solution to nuclear waste that we need to be responsible for. I'm a strong supporter of acquiring the nuclear propulsion technology for the Royal Australian Navy and we should absolutely take responsibility for the spent fuel rods that are a byproduct of that. Sally, I know you've got strong feelings about this. Oh, look, I don't care about the submarines. I don't <laughs> really care about them at all. I do care about where that nuclear waste goes. Um, you know, it's we here in South Australia, we suffered with Maralinga and Emu Junction and those nuclear bombs. And, you know, our communities weren't consulted and that has been devastating for a long, long time now. So those, those um, nuclear bombs were in their 50s. So we really need to make sure that the conversations is for and is with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander mob from the get-go. Where is it going to go? How is that being... How is... Where, what that looks like, all of that has to include mob. It has to include that traditional owners from the get-go not at the end of it and saying oh we've picked this location you're saying it with the science and with you know looking at it properly from the start they need to be included not at the very end saying look the, we think these are the two locations what do you guys think it's like no from the get-go and we can bring you the result of our online poll now. We asked you, with only five days until the Voice to Parliament referendum, have you decided which way you're voting? More than 9,700 responded. Here's how you voted. 80% of you say you have decided. 12% uh, say you have not. Uh, so that's a very interesting conclusion. Oh. Obviously, very, very sure people watch <laughs> Q&A. You're very sure people. <laughs> And everyone on this panel has been sure of themselves. Please give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. That's all we have time for. Thank you to our panel, Natasha Wanganeen, James Stevens, Linda Burney, Peter Malinowskis, and Sally Scales. 
And thank you for joining the conversation. Particularly thank you so much for sharing your stories and questions and to this excellent Adelaide uh, live audience that's come out in such big numbers. Thank you so much. You've made it such a delightful night. <laughs> Next week, I'll be with you live from Melbourne and we'll be on the other side of the referendum. We most certainly will have a result. So we'll be able to digest what it means. Former Foreign Affairs Minister Alexander Downer will be on our panel. Independent Senator Lydia Thorpe. Liberal Senator James McGrath joins us too. And advertising guru Dee Madigan. Head to our website to register to be in the audience. And I hope you can. I'd love to see you in Melbourne next Monday night. Have a terrific night. Enjoy your democracy sausages. Catch you later. <laughs>